Okay, it says it's recording. Hey, okay. Um, so, um, this is uh, uh, my presentation on uh, out of body experiences and astral projection, whatever. Oh, we got a couple more people coming. Come on in. Um, so, Rick at the uh, Mystery Phenomena. Let's have them introduce themselves. Oh, okay. Who are you folks? Spencer. Spencer? All right, Rebecca, and uh, we have these folks who are already here. What brought you guys here? Rick, do you want to step over here so you're on camera more? Camera. Oh, you want me to? Off about here. Um, you want to? I just saw it on the meetup. Mm -hmm. um, just a couple of the topics sounded interesting, and astral projection uh, today sounded particularly interesting. So, how long have y'all been here? Uh, on the coast, we've been here five years. I, I We're in Long Beach. How did you find, did you find Meetup or did you get one of the flyers? I found it on meetup.com. That's, that's interesting. More and more people are coming to Meetup. What I've found is that people find this site, they see mystery phenomena, and go, oh, I love it. And then they don't show up. So what did you not show, what did you not get? So I did the opposite. I didn't say I was going to show up, that's, and I did show up. That's why, <laughs> that's why I call it mystery phenomena. It's a mystery why. Mystery who's going to I didn't call it deer hunting and fishing phenomenon because it would have been very popular here for football. There would have been 10,000 people here too. Right. This is Bob Pe uh, Peterson. Yeah. And, uh, is it Peterson or Peterson? Peterson. Yeah. And he, I uh, met him a couple weeks ago and he uh, brought some, some books with him. I was holding groups about once a month, maybe every two weeks sometimes. And I've been holding them on all kinds of different phenomena, from Bigfoot to the uh, flying saucers, to the government conspiracies, to you name it. Uh, everything outside of normal stuff. And yet, the normal stuff is, is really not nearly as, as interesting as what we talked about here. What I wanted to to tell everybody before we start, because you never know who's coming, is that the, the first thing that you, you should have when you come to a meeting like this, or a group like this, is an open mind. If you don't have an open mind, if, you, if your mind is already shut, like a gate, everything outside of that gate will never get in. It's only once you open that gate or door that you have an opportunity to actually learn and experience what I call awareness. Because awareness is everything inside, it's not the outside. If you're outside the walls of Jericho, you don't know what's going on inside. If you open that gate, now you have accessibility to everything. Um, one of the things, uh, I'm not going to talk about UFOs and things, I'm just mentioning that we do. But some of the groups I've, I've had, I've, I've blown up actual ancient drawings and artwork in which UFOs appear uh, with the Mary Magdalene and I've printed out in my entire group on prosecuting the government of the United States for lying to people and I had their own word in their own words when they uh, actually reported that a flying saucer had crashed in Roswell, New Mexico the government actually issued that report and they retracted it the next day. Um, I also showed where the Ford Flying Saucer actually came from. That was Kenneth Arnold, 1947. And I actually blew one of these things up and showed a man standing here looking up at it and even the dog looking up at it. And it looks certainly like today's Flying Saucers. So that's basically all I wanted to say because I want Bob to be able to do this stuff. I've also done some groups, and I'm doing this for, for you guys' benefit if you decide to come to some other groups. If I choose to hold some more groups, I've done them on chakras and uh, body centers, Kundalini. I've done them on the astral plane to, to a, a limited degree. The astral plane is it's just a, a lower level of existence where non physical beings exist. If you don't know anything about it, I think he's going to probably cover that. Um, and so with that, and the other group I did two weeks ago was, was on consciousness, the, you know, consciousness and the different levels of consciousness that we, we 
this is like the, the basement level for all of us. So in the future, I can go back and do some of those groups. The very first group I did, we had eight people show up at the Iberville Library, and I said, this group is going to be a lot like one of those long-running TV series, and where they sell um, the Game of Thrones year one, year two, year three, and somebody's going to come in in year four and go, I don't know who that guy with the hatchet is. And you're going to have to say, well, you need to go back and watch game one, two, three, four, and then you'll know who that guy with the hatchet is. So it's kind of like that when we get new people, they go, well, I, I heard of some of that, but not the other stuff. So it's not, it is a process. It's not a matter of you're going to come to one class or one group or one meeting or what, whatever, and suddenly there's all the information because there's so much information we could hold this group if we live to be infinite beings and in the physical sense we could go on for 10,000 years and never cover all the material in this group and I don't know we probably have more people show up after that but anyway thank you for coming and now I introduce Bob Peterson who's going to give us the scene. Hi nice to meet you um, as Rick said, that I, well, first of all, I want to thank Rick for uh, inviting me to come talk to you about out-of-body experiences, astral projection, and all of that. And uh, I'm wearing one of my favorite shirts, uh, Astral Projection, Who Needs a Body Anyway? This was created by my wife, Kathy, and kind of designed it together. She has an embroidery unit, and, and so she made it happen. She manifested it into reality. Anyway, uh, hacking the out-of-body experience. Uh, forgive me, this, this presentation, I kind of threw it together quickly, so uh, it may not flow completely uh, uh, very well, but I got a lot of information to cover. And one of my goals is I want to leave room at the end for questions and answers and any topics that you guys want to talk about. Um, first of all, and I'm going to talk fast because I'm a northerner, and, <laughs> and us northerners talk fast, and secondly, because i got a lot of material to cover. Um, so first of all, credentials. Why should you listen to me? Um, well, I've been studying and inducing out-of-body experiences, astral projection, since 1979, and so that's more than 40 years of personal experience. Um, I've got a collection of more than 200 books on the topic, and that does not, cover, uh, that does not include peripheral topics like near-death experience, lucid dreaming, altered states of consciousness. That's just 200 books um, on out-of-body experience astral projection. Um, I've uh, uh, wrote three books on out-of-body experience. My first one was written in 19, uh, well, it was published in 1997. Um, and it's gotten some uh, good. Uh, the camera. Um, it's gotten some good um, readership. It's available in a few uh, languages besides English. It's available in Czech and in German, for example, and in uh, Japanese and some other languages, Russian as well. Um, and my latest book uh, is Hacking the Out of Body Experience. Um, okay, so here's a picture of my OBE library. This was a couple years ago before uh, I've. I've acquired several, many OBE books since then, but you can see there's at least 200. Um, and I've got a much bigger, this is only three shelves of a much bigger library. Um, so the first question you may want to uh, ask is, what is an out-of-body experience or astral projection? Um, well, to me, it is a fully conscious experience in which your entire awareness seems to be separated from your physical body. Um, in other words, it's a dissociative experience um, but that's not all uh, very unusual for humans to have dissociative experiences because every dream you have at night is a dissociative experience. You're dissociating your awareness from the inputs from your physical body. Uh, your body in other words, in an OBE, um, your physical body is just another inanimate object in the room. So there's my bed, there's my dresser, there's my body, whatever. Okay, so you're standing there, it basically feels very much like you're a, a ghost and you can go anywhere and do anything. Um, however, I need to point out something that uh, I learned from Susan Blackmore, uh, who's a skeptic on OBEs. The experience of being out of body doesn't mean that you are out of body. Um, although people who've had the experience, and um, it, it's hard to convince them otherwise because it's very realistic. Um, and we'll go over some of the evidence uh, in a little bit later. So our OBE is a new thing. Um, no, actually, they've been reported throughout human history. Um, there are writings about them in the ancient Egyptian Book of the Dead. Um, the ancient um, Tibetan Buddhism has the, the, the ancient Tibetan Book of the Dead. Um, the uh, 
the Bartol Sodol, and it mentions out-of-body states and all of this stuff and what you're supposed to do when you die. There's also mentions of out-of-body stuff in the Bible. Uh, St. Paul writes in the Second Corinthians that he knew a Christian, man, a, a man in Christ who uh, 14 years ago um, was taken into uh, as, as far as the seventh heaven and, and saw things so secret that they can't be uh, spoken of and all of this. And he says, uh, St. Paul says this twice, I don't know whether it was in the body or out of the body. And he, said, he repeats that twice. To me, I don't know about you guys, but um, to me that implies that out-of-body stuff was kind of matter-of-fact back then, and that he's not thinking of it in terms of, oh, this is a sin, this is badness. There's actually nothing in the Bible that says that OBEs are sin or anything. And if you talk uh, to any uh, uh, very um, uh, fanatical Christians, they'll say, oh, it's a sin. And I say, where in the Bible does it say it's a sin? They can't point out anything. What they say is, it's witchcraft. Well, it's not witchcraft. Um, but it's a very popular argument of Christians uh, against it. But in fact, St. Paul mentions it in the Bible rather matter-of-factly. Um, it's a universal phenomenon. So it's uh, uh, available to people in all cultures, all religions, um, all demographics, both sexes. Uh, uh, there's nothing really that it, it doesn't discriminate. Um, and it's also sometimes called astral projection, thus my shirt. Um, so another thing people ask is, is this some kind of disorder? Um, should I be seeing a psychiatrist or something like that? Um, Robert Monroe, one of the very, uh, a, a guy who made the out-of-body experience kind of popular, um, he, that's the first thing he did when he started having them is he saw a, a psychiatrist. He knew a lot of professionals. Um, Six-figure people were close friends of his. And so he went to a, one of these guys and he was tested and said, nope. He went to a doctor, nope, there's nothing physically wrong with you. He went to a psychiatrist, nope, there's nothing wrong with you. Um, well, in 1984, there was a book called With the Eyes of the Mind, and it was published. Um, the authors are Glenn Gabbard and Stuart Twemlow, and they are professional uh, psych uh, psychiatrists. And um, what they found is that OBEs are not related to any of the uh, m uh, major uh, phenomena in psychology. They're, it's not related to depersonalization, autoscopy, schizophrenia, or any of these other things. In fact, the vast majority of OBEs happen to normal, everyday, well-adjusted people. Um, so why, some people might be asking, why on earth would you want to do an out-of-body experience? Um, there's several good reasons. Um, exploring the afterlife, because I believe that the vast majority of the information we have today about the afterlife, right? Reports of heaven, reports of this and that, all come from someone's personal religious experience, right? If you, if you read, for example, the Revelation of John, the very last book of the Bible, I think it's one long out-of-body experience. He's talking about being taken up to heaven and he felt vibrations and everything else. To me, it's classic. There's no question it's an out-of-body experience. And he's describing all of these different things and he sees all these visions. But... Um, so a lot of the information that we have today, both superstition and otherwise, comes from people's personal out-of-body experience and from re their religious experiences as well. Um, other reasons to do it, um, visiting lo uh, loved, dead, uh, lost, dead loved ones, um, being able to say the last goodbye. Um, I, I had uh, out-of-body experiences in, in which I was with my uh, father after he had died and with my mother after she had died. And there are reports, I'm by no means unique, there are reports all throughout the literature of this. Um, although it's not real common in the literature, there are several reports of it. Um, there's one guy whose son committed suicide and he met him afterward in an out-of-body experience and it was a very touching um, experience. Um, Another reason is for spiritual growth, to, to unite the religions, because if we can all agree upon what's in the afterlife and what this universal consciousness is, we could stop all this bickering between Islam and Christianity and Buddhism and Hin you know, Hinduism and all of this. It's like, no, let's, there's a common ground between all of these. Let's find it. Let's study it scientifically. Let's figure out what this common ground is and let's agree. Right? So we might be able to solve a lot of the world's problems with it. Um, and learning about our own human nature as well. And in fact, uh, you can also use out-of-body to meet spiritual masters like Jesus Christ. 
And is there a precedent for that? Yes, there is. I've actually had one experience in which I felt as if I was in Christ's presence and he was teaching, with, with, uh, teaching other people. But I was there and I knew it and I could feel it. Other people, and again, I'm not unique in that either. There are other reports of people standing in Christ's presence and seeing him and being with him. Um, so if a Christian comes to you and says that it's, you know, oh, it's against Christ or whatever, would you rather read what somebody else said about Christ or would you rather meet the man himself, shake his hand, and maybe give him a hug or listen to him in person? There's a big difference there, and this can open up that door. Um, how did I get into out-of-body experiences is the next question. Um, well, in 1979, uh, my brother Joe uh, bought this book, Journeys Out of the Body, um, for, my, for my dad as a present. And I, I don't remember if it was for Father's Day or what, but I went, anyway, it was in the second half of the year. And when uh, my dad was done with it, I asked to borrow it, and I read it. And I was like consumed with this idea. It's like I'm a very scientific, skeptical guy. I'm a very analytical thinker. I'm a computer analyst, professional. Still am today. I didn't believe a word Monroe was saying. And I, I, we talked about this with Rick last time a little bit. I didn't believe a, a word Monroe was saying because he had all these wild stories about, okay, you walk up to a wall, you put your hand through the wall, you can feel the texture of that wall, you can feel the nails that are on the other side of that wall and all of this stuff, or you can feel the peeling paint, or you can put your hand through the floor or through the ceiling or whatever, or you can feel the fan blades cutting through you or whatever, you know? And it's like, well, if what this guy is saying, he sounded like a nutcase, right? But if what he's saying is true, it is a completely different paradigm of reality because science doesn't have any room for that. You know, they don't, uh, they, they don't have any room for the uh, non-physical um, side of life. And so I was intrigued with this idea, and as any good um, skeptical scientific person would do, I gave Monroe the benefit of the doubt. His book said, don't believe me, try it for yourself, see what happens. Well, I did. I, I tried. He has a technique in, in, his first, in this book. Um, this is his first of three. And his technique involved uh, visualizing some lines of force and, and all of this. And I was very shocked. Um, to the core when I tried his technique and I got immediate results. I did not leave my body that day, but I, was, I had the vibrations, this was a precursor to an OBE, the vibrations swept into my body, I literally felt like I was being electrocuted, and it was the scariest experience of my life to that point. Um, and so the, the, the vibrations are, are very scary, very rough, very electrical, and I thought, oh crap, Monroe wasn't lying. <laughs> this is in big trouble that I'm getting over my head. But I knew at that point, science, which I so dearly loved, I mean, I was always the nerdy kid in school, right, who was reading science books. All my other classmates were reading, you know, you know storybooks. And I was always in the, in the, reading about dinosaurs and stuff like that in the kids' library of the public school. And so I was very skeptical and scientific, and it's like, science had no room for out-of-body, so I need to explore, who, who are you going to trust? You going to try, could, you know, I didn't trust Monroe, and I'm not sure, I'm sure as hell not going to trust somebody else who says that they're, they're out, you know, flying or whatever. What I knew to, to, to trust is myself, my own personal experience, and that's what I want to impart on you, first of all, is trust your own experience. Induce the OBE yourself, see what's out there. Um, and so I knew I had to experience it myself. And as I said, um, I encountered fear, right? Because the vibrations are very scary if you're not used to them. And they do um, get better over time. After you've done several out-of-body experiences, they seem to calm down. Your fear kind of mitigates. you kind of saying, okay, I'll just kind of go with the flow, see what this is, or whatever. So they get better over the years. So, um, so it's a fact of life. If you have an out-of-body experience, you're going to experience fear. Um, because, and fear can interfere with your out-of-body experiences um, because it can stop you in your tracks. You can abort the experience before it even gets started. And when you're in an OBE, you're confronting mankind's or humankind's two biggest fears, which is the fear of death and fear of the unknown. These are things that are um, basic instinctual things, a self-preservation thing built into your physical body. It's supposed to be afraid of the unknown. It's supposed to be, you know... Anyway, fear is a protection mechanism. Um, there's also fear of possession, right? People are afraid, oh, can a demon get into my body while I'm away? Um, people have, have tried. Um, I had a friend named Lisa uh, 
in the, in the 80s, and she said that she came back from an out-of-body experience one only to find a spirit of a woman or a ghost or whatever trying to enter her body, and the spirit could not animate her body. So she yelled at it, told it to get the hell out, which is good advice, by the way. If somebody's trying to uh, get in your body or affect your body, just yell at them, scream at them, get mad. Um, don't fear, because fear is, is the enemy. Um, it's much better to be uh, uh, pissed off, angry, whatever, and confront uh, these, these things head on directly um, than it is to succumb to fear. Um, so I kind of like this, I got the Facebook meme here. Oh, so you can leave your body. I borrow it. <laughs> um, okay, so that, that leads to the question, uh, you know, what's the scariest thing, sometimes people ask, what's the scariest thing I've ever encountered in an OBE? Um, well, first of all, the vast majority of the OBEs I've had have been positive. Um, very uh, uplifting, uh, very um, non-threatening. I haven't felt unsafe in, I've only felt unsafe in a handful of OBEs. Um, there have only been a few scary ones, and that's since 1979, so that's 40 years. Um, and if you do get in trouble, get over your head, or if you're afraid, the easiest thing to do is to return to your body, and that's a very simple thing to do. Um, the, probably the scariest thing I ever encountered is one time I, I left my body, and I was, poof, I was immediately in unfamiliar surroundings, and I was surrounded by what looked like a dirty, angry mob. And this is like your typical, you know, pitchfork crowd that stands outside Frankenstein's castle, right? They're angry, they want to hurt someone, and they looked like they were going to come after me. And I just said, nope. And I just kind of, I just kind of let myself fall backward into the body, and I was, I was done, right? And so that's as easy as it gets. Just abort the experience, no problem. I've also had some scary creatures uh, jump out at me, you know. I'm trying to focus my mind into an OBE, and all of a sudden I'll see an old hag, you know, in my face, and that's a startle response, and they, that can't be helped. But again, there's no harm come from it, uh, no problems with it, uh, and facing your fears and, and just uh, going ahead anyway is usually your best course. Um, next uh, fear is, can you get lost? Sorry, Rick, I'm kind of standing in your way here. Um, can you get lost? Yes, you can. You, you, you can get anywhere you want, but not permanently. You'll always end up back in your physical body. Um, I've been in plenty of uh, unknown locations. I'll, I'll, I have had OBEs in which I've been in the blackness of space. I see stars all around me in all directions, and there isn't a sun in sight. There isn't a planet in sight. I, am, I have no idea where I'm at, so I'm, I'm just completely lost. And boom, but, but the experience is, is soon over and it seems like your body will call you back when it's ready or when it's time. Um, so uh, there's also this place called The Void, which Frederick Ardema um, talks about in his book, um, in which there are no stars or anything. It's just kind of like a gray void and he uses that for a jumping off uh, point for going to other places. Um, okay, so next topic. Um, what if I told you you leave your body every night, but you're too aware to notice? Okay, this is something that a lot of people don't talk about, but we actually do um, leave our body every night. Um, I've, I've personally verified this. This is not something I believe. This is something I witnessed per, uh, firsthand. And um, in fact, there are four out-of-body states that, that I've I identified, and I, I kind of break them down as this. Um, if you are unconscious and you're in a subjective hallucination, this is a, a self-created hallucination, that's what we call a dream, that's an ordinary dream. If, you're in, if, you're, if you gain consciousness and you become conscious, but you're still in that hallucinated environment, that's a lucid dream. And they're kind of related to out-of-body. Um, a lot of the uh, people who practice lucid dreaming and out-of-body do the same kind of exercises in a lot of cases. Um, and you can transition from the lucid dream state to the out-of-body state. In an out-of-body state, it's more you're, you're conscious, just like a lucid dream. So you're as conscious and awake as you are now, although you might feel a little groggy sometimes, depending on the circumstances. It's kind of like me before I've had coffee in the morning. Um, but you're conscious, and it seems like the world is more objective, right? In a lucid dream, for example, um, being a self-created hallucination, um, if I see a doorway and I can think to myself, you know, I expect a beautiful woman to be on the other side of that door. When I open that door, I expect a beautiful woman to be there. You can open that door and there will be a beautiful woman there. That would be me. 
That would be, that would be happy. <laughs> Um, in an out-of-body experience, your, your reality does not necessarily meet your expectations, right? I, you can see a doorway and say, uh, when I you know, open this doorway, you know, you can try to open the doorway, your hand might go through the doorknob, right? And, you, and the act of moving forward toward that door might propel you enough to go right through the door. And there is the beautiful one over there, your, your expectations are not meeting reality. And so things are, the, the rules of engagement are completely different there. Um, and then there's the fourth quadrant is what I call a shared dream. This is where it's uncon where you're unconscious, so you you know you're dreaming. You wake up and you've got that memory of a dream, but you don't you weren't conscious at the time. But and yet it still seems like you're in some kind of objective reality. So you've got uh, uh, like Rob, uh, author Robert Moss talks about these um, cases in which well and Ro Robert Wagoner, a lucid dreaming expert, who's written a couple books on auto or on lucid dreaming, also says that. You can have these experiences in which you're in a shared environment and you might still be dreaming and you're not conscious, but you can agree with your friend that, yeah, we were standing at the Golden Gate Bridge last night and we saw this rabbit on the road and he shouldn't have been there, all this stuff like that, and it matches, it agrees, you were, you were, it's like you were really there, but you weren't conscious at the time. Okay, so this is the four OBE states. Um, I could go on about this for hours, and in fact I have. I gave a talk at um, IMAX, which is an organization that studies this kind of stuff um, in Austin, Texas. And I was like two hours long or whatever, just on this topic alone. So the question is, um, why do we dissociate during sleep? Um, Sylvan Muldoon, which is one of the earliest uh, modern era people who wrote about the out-of-body experience, thought it was to recharge the astral body. Um, scientists, and, and I'm a more, still more of a scientific kind of guy, scientists now know that we, um, we, your brain is basically being laundered during your sleep. Um, you, you, during conscious activity, when you're awake doing stuff, your brain accumulates, you know, different plaques and, and things, different, you know, uh, different things that interfere with your, your consciousness. So the later up you stay, the more, you know, you, you, the, the harder it is, it seems to think. Um, so when you go to sleep at night, part of the function of sleep is to uh, launder your brain. And why do you need to, and when you're doing your laundry, you can't do your laundry when you're wearing your clothes, right? You've got to take them off to launder them. And so uh, we have to dissociate uh, with our physical body and with that brain in order to have it properly laundered. That's my belief. Um, so I wanted to talk about the o OBEs and the brain and what we know, what scientists know. Um, in the 1930s, there was a, a, a neuroscientist by the name of Wilder Penfield, and he had a patient with um, epilepsy, so she had seizures, and he was trying to figure out, and this is a very bad case, so he opened up her skull, and he, he removed a section of her skull, and he was using a probe to figure out what was causing the um, epilepsy, the, the seizures, because seizures... I don't know if you know much about seizures, but seizures is when you get an electrical signal on one side of the brain and it ricochets it back and forth. It's like feedback if you put two microphones next to each other and there's a sound, those, each one will echo back to each other and it'll get louder and louder and louder until it's you know, obnoxiously loud, until you separate those microphones or turn one off. Well, epilepsy is a very similar thing. You have an electrical, a small electrical storm on one side of your brain, and it bounces back and forth through the, uh, the connecting fiber, the uh, corpus callosum um, that has both, that connects both sides of the brain, and it feeds back itself like this um, until it's a seizure and you can't control anything you're doing. Um, so Gilbert Penfield was trying to figure out what was stimulating these seizures, and he was taking his probe and he had the woman's skull open, and of course. The brain has no uh, nerve endings, so it doesn't, you can't feel a thing. When you're in there poking at your brain, you won't feel it. But he was poking with a probe in various locations, and he was trying to figure this out. And um, at one point, the woman cried out, Oh my God, I'm leaving my body, I'm leaving my body. Okay, so he kind of noted that it was on the right-hand side, and it was near this area, but he didn't really document well where it was he was stimulating. Um, well, fast forward to the year 2002 about, um, uh, another neuroscientist by the name of Olaf Blanca, um, he had he, another woman with um, seizures as well. He actually removed a piece of the skull and he uh, planted inside her brain beneath the, the there's a, a membrane on the outside of your brain to protect it, 
And he, he went under the brain and, and planted some, a grid of, of subdural electrodes. Um, and then he was able to send tiny electrical signals back and forth across this grid to try and narrow down exactly where the seizures were being caused. And again, he had someone uh, report that they had out-of-body experiences, and he was able to pinpoint, well, this is a specific area of the brain called the temporal parietal junction um, of the brain. Um, in the later uh, 2000s, um, Michael Persinger, another couple of um, uh, neuroscientists, Michael Persinger, um, who is now passed on, and uh, Stanley Corin, um, they used a less invasive technique called transcranial magnetic stimulation and they uh, basically were able to um, point in a, uh, like a, a, a magnetic um, thing, they used in a, a, like a, a magnetic thing to stimulate the inside of the brain, right? Uh, without opening the brain up because magnetism and electricity are always bound together. So when you twist electricity, it'll make magnetism. When you twist magnetism, it'll make electricity and so forth. And, um, so they were able to recreate Olaf Blanke's results and figure out that this right temporal, parietal, right temporal parietal junction of the brain um, has something to do with out-of-body experiences. And um, they were able to pinpoint it a little bit closer to an area called the angular gyrus or gyrus or whatever, I don't know how it's pronounced. And that is a feature of the RTPJ. Um, so this is where I'm talking about the, the temporal parietal junction on the right side of the brain. So it's back right here. And this is where the parietal lobe of the brain and the temporal lobe of the brain meet. Okay, it's not just the RT, it's not just the, the TPJ that's responsible for out-of-body experiences or what scientists know about them. There are many functions. The brain's a very, very complex uh, piece of apparatus. So we've also got effects in the prefrontal cortex, the medial prefrontal cortex, the posterior cingulate cortex. Um, there's a whole uh, there, there's a whole thing in, in neuroscience called the default mode network. Um, that becomes activated when you're not doing something task specific. So if you're like doing a math problem, you're using the task positive network. And when you're kind of daydreaming, that's the uh, uh, default mode network. And there's a relationship between what's going on. But these temporal parietal junctions um, are, are hubs in the uh, de uh, default mode network. And then there's also the pineal gland. Um, Michael Strassman, who did a book called the, uh, the, on DMT, the, the Spirit Molecule, um, Dimethyltryptamine. Um, it's responsible for a lot of psychedelic experiences, hallucination. And if you look at powerful hallucinogens, really all the hallucinogens like LSD, uh, psilocybin, uh, you name it, all of the hallucinogens are just like uh, DMT, except DMT twisted with like another molecule. DMT, the body is able to eliminate from the body very quickly, so you get a very temporary, fast, 15-minute high. If you ha uh, have like an LSD molecule, it's, it's like DMT and it binds to the same neural transmitters and, and stuff. It's a neural transmitter and it binds to the same receptors in the brain. Um, but it'll give you a much longer high because it takes the body a lot longer to eliminate from your system. Okay, so these, these TPJs, um, the left one, as far as sites knows, is in an area called Wernicke's area. It's a language interpretation area, and it translates mental ease into language. The right TPJ, that's where Winter Pil uh, Penfield, we think, and Michael Persinger and Stanley Korn and all those guys, all those neuroscientists were stimulating to produce these OBEs, right? Um, so what I believe is that it analyzes sensory data, um, and from that sensory data it builds a body schema, which is the map of your physical body. And it builds a second thing called, which I call a story of experience. Okay, the body schema and story of experience, um, the TPJ uses sense data, right? It, it pulls all the senses, the sense of sight, sense of sound, touch, smell, taste. Um, although it relies much heavier on sight and touch because as human beings we're more sight oriented and, and touch oriented. Um, it also relies on beliefs and assumptions and, and things like how gravity works and our knowledge of, and you know what our past has told us. Um, 
The important thing to remember is that inner events and outer events are treated the same by our physical body, right? So your imagination can override what the uh, TPJ decides. It will pull the senses, but it'll make its own decision. Okay, so what is the story of experience? It's a fiction we tell ourselves about what's happening. You may think you know what's happening, you may think you're watching this crazy guy ramble on about the ease. Um, but really what's happening is that your brain is interpreting a, a set of data and it's coming up with this story of what's happening to you. Um, when we dream at night, um, and we all dream at night, we have a fictional story of experience, right, that happens to us. So you discard this physical one for now and you assume this story of experience that's completely fictional. Um, and your imagination can alter it. Like I said, it's a self-created hallucination. So, um, uh, so anyway, the physical body is directly um, influenced by your imagination. And, the, the story, and it influences the story of experience. So if you imagine food, for example, something mouth-watering, your mouth will water, right? If a man uh, imagines a, a sexual scenario with a naked woman or whatever, they might get an erection, right? So these are very physical responses to an imaginary event. Um, so to induce an out-of-body experience, um, it's as, well, it's not, it's not as simple as this, but it, it can be reduced to this. First, you have to relax your body completely. I mean, totally, completely, to the point where you can't even feel your body anymore, right? That is eliminating the sense of touch from your RTPJ's ability to create a story of experience. You do the practice in darkness as, or, or very dim light, and that's basically eliminating the sense of sight. So you have your eyes closed as well, usually. Um, so you're eliminating the, the TPJ's sense of sight, so it can't use that anymore. And then you do this in silence, so you eliminate the sound data from your TPJ as well. Um, some people go as far as lighting incense, and so they're eliminating the sense of smell as well, or masking over it. And then with all of these senses basically eliminated or reduced to a tiny, tiny trickle, your sense of imagination has much vast... Um, uh, effect on what your story of experience is. So what happens is you use your imagination to override these things. You say, no, I'm not lying on the couch. No, I'm not you know, trying to induce an OBE. I'm standing at my front doorway. And you can imagine your front doorway, for example. That's uh, one of the techniques, a uh, popular technique called the target technique, where you walk through, in your imagination, your entire house, or wherever you want to, really, but your front door is something that's very familiar with you, or maybe your bathroom mirror, and you try to imagine, okay, this is what it looks like, this is what it sounds like, this is what it feels like, you feel the no doorknob, all of this stuff. Um, so you override those things, and you tell yourself, this is my new story of experience. I'm in the bathroom, I'm, I'm not lying on the couch trying to induce an OBE, I'm in the bathroom, okay? Um, but you only need to use your imagination long enough um, to derail the, the brain's story of experience. And that's what you're getting, that's your, the goal. And what happens is you're altering your body schema and you're altering your story of experience. And once, you're, um, once you've re -de derailed that story of experience, then you're in an out-of-body experience. Your consciousness can return back to normal, basically normal. So now you're, you're normal. You're back to a normal uh, mode of thinking. You're not using your imagination anymore, but you are now. You, your story of experience has been derailed and re-altered to be in this other location outside of the physical body. Okay, does that mean that OBEs are imaginary? No. Um, we use the imagination to redirect the story of experience, but that's where it ends. Um, once you're inside an OBE, your, your thoughts go back to normal. Your emotions pretty much go back to normal. Um, and, but your sense perceptions are redirected. Um, what is that directed to? Nobody really knows, but it behaves, as I said before, like an objective reality. Um, is there any, which, which brings up a good question, is there any proof that OBEs are real? How do you know it's not just your imagination, right? Um, there's a, a great book, and I'd encourage everyone to read it, called Consciousness Beyond the Body um, by Alexander Defoe and um, Full disclosure, I, I donated a chapter to the book, it's many chapters, but it covers all of the physical evidence. 
evidence of whether OBEs are real. And it's only available, last I looked, as an e-book. So let's see, it's not a physical paperback book, or whatever. You've got to download it to an iPad or an e-reader or Kindle or whatever. But it's free on Amazon. So you can go out to Amazon, download it for free, read it. Um, it goes over a lot of the evidence. Um, uh, every OBE adept person, um, people who, who are good at this, who have trained themselves to leave the body, um, they usually go through a phase where they want to or need to obtain proof for themselves. They got to establish that this is that they're not just hallucinating, and so they all go through this phase. Um, so there are a lot of stories out there. Um, uh, one of my favorite proof um, stories comes from uh, Rodrigo Montenegro's uh, book. Um, it's called the uh, Out of Body Anthology or something like that. Um, and in this book, one of his and it's all out of body. Uh, uh, stories. But one of the stories he gives is of a, a, a guy who was having an out-of-body experience. He left his body, he's like lying on the couch, and he left his body. Uh, I may not have all of the facts straight, but he leaves his body and he walks down the hallway and he thinks, this is really cool. I'm in an out-of-body, but you know, is this real? I don't know if this is real or really happening to me or not. So he looks out the window, it's, uh, the hallway of his apartment or whatever, um, he's got windows in, in, in the hallway. So he goes and he looks out the window of the hallway and he, he, goes, into the, um, he goes into the parking lot of his, of his apartment building and there's all these cars. He said, this is really cool. I should find my own car. That'll be proof. And he says, my car's red. Where's my car? That one's white. That one's white. That... Wait a minute. Hey, they're all white. This can't be real because all the cars are white. It just doesn't make any sense. My car isn't here. I don't see it. Crap. So he goes back to his body. Then he, he, he walks past the window or whatever. He gets up out of, off the couch or whatever, walks past the, the window, and he looks out there. It had just snowed. All the cars were white. <laughs> okay, so things like that. Um, there's also uh, Charles Tart as a scientist, uh, probably my, my hero. Um, I've only got two heroes in life. One is Charles Tart, and one is uh, Leonardo da Vinci. Um, be, and both of them are a bridge between the spiritual side and the science side. And I like that, that point because I don't believe in woo-woo, new age crap. I believe that everything is, there's no such thing as supernatural. Everything is natural. It's, if it appears otherwise, we just don't understand it as well, enough. Um, so Charles Tard is a scientist. He studied Robert Monroe, the guy who I read his Journeys Out of the Body book, got me going. He studied uh, Robert Monroe, and he studied this Miss Z. Um, this is a woman who was complaining that she had outer bodies almost every night. So he put, Tart, Tart put her in a laboratory, hooked her up to EEGs, and then he uh, took a, a random five-digit number out of a book. They had, back in those days, they didn't have computers that could generate true random numbers. Um, no, computers are notoriously bad at picking random numbers. Um, so he went to this book that scientists, that, that physicists use. Um, it's just tables, pages after pages of, of random numbers. So he opened it to a random page and he put his finger on, you know, closed his eyes, put his finger on a random number, and he wrote down the numbers, 41635, whatever. And then he put it on a paper, folded it up, whatever, put, slipped it in an envelope. Then he went back into, this is done in a different room. Then he went back into the experiment uh, lab where she was lying there hooked up to EEG machines and all these recorders. And then he, he slipped it in the envelope on top of a shelf at the top of her bed, out, real close to the ceiling. And there's no way she could have sat up or anything because her, her head was like completely tethered with all these cables, right? So, um, and they did this for several nights, but on one night um, she reported that she left her body and she floated up to the ceiling and she called out the right five numbers. She came back to her body and she said, I got the numbers, they're blah, 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 and, rattled, and she rattled them off. Um, Tart went up there, got the envelope, read them off, and verified they were the same five numbers. What are the odds of that? One in 10,000. It's easy statistics, right? Um, still, um, other experiments haven't been as lucky. Um, with Robert Monroe, he, he tried to do the same thing with Robert Monroe, who had lots of auto bodies. Um, Robert Monroe was not able to identify the target properly, but he had an out-of-body on one of the nights, and um, he floated out of his body, and he um, couldn't find the woman who was supposed to be in the lab watching him, keeping an eye on him, make sure he wasn't cheating or anything. 
So he couldn't find her out of his body, or he's out of his body, right? He's left the body, and he can't find his, his person, who, the woman who was supposed to be watching him. So he walks out through the building to the other side, outside the building, um, and there he finds, standing with this lab technician, he sees the lab technician talking to a man. And so he comes back to his body and he describes it. And as a matter of fact, at that exact time, she was out of there, out of the booth. She was talking to her husband, who had come to visit her in the middle of the night. Um, so anyway, that was that was proof, but it wasn't the proof they were hoping for, right? Um, other things. Uh, Dr. Eben Alexander has a book called *Proof of Heaven*, in which he had a near-death experience um, from uh, caused by bacterial meningitis. Um, I think it was bacterial, and it was one of the forms of meningitis that's almost always fatal. And in fact, it, it was pretty much fatal for him. He was in the hospital for months, I think. It completely, like, completely shut down his brain's cortex, which is the outer layer of the brain where all of the analytical thinking is done. And scientists think all of the experience is, is in the cortex. And there are routes that travel through the brain to different functions or whatever, but it's mainly the cortex that does all of the thinking. Anyway, this meningitis completely shut down his neocortex. And Eben Alexander is a, he's a brain surgeon, so he knows this stuff. He knows exactly what's going on. He knows what happens to the brain uh, from a, a scientific technical standpoint. And there was no way that he could have thought anything, but yet he had this involved, long involved out of body experience in which he described, you know, this, this being of, of uh, one with the universe and all of this. Very um, interesting and touching story. Um, Vincent Turvey is a, was a medium way back in the, the heydays of mediumship in the United States, um, like in the 1920s. And he had several OBEs. He was a very sickly man. Um, he, uh, people in the, in the neighborhood were holding seances like every Friday night, so what he would do is he would leave his bodies on Friday night and he would travel out of body and try to inhabit the spirit medium. And he, he, you know, he would come through the spirit medium and they'd say, what's your name? My name is Vincent Turvey. And he'd do like automatic writing through the medium's hand. My name is Vincent Turvey and all this stuff. And then later on, he got several people, lots of people to um, sign testimonials, basically, swearing that they had seen this happen. Um, and that he was, and that Vincent Turvey was able to control the medium's body. Um, there's also the case of Akena. She is a, was a uh, teacher. She's no longer with us. She passed on. She was a French teacher uh, of out-of-body experiences. And... Um, she had an experience in 2004, December 26, 2004, in which um, she thought about her, she left her body, she was a teacher, so she was very adept, she left her body, she thought about her friend who was traveling abroad, because the previous day, she got a letter in the mail, um, back in the snail mail days, she got a, a letter in the mail from her friend saying, oh, having a great time, I'm in Java or something like that, Indonesia or whatever, and um, so she leaves her body and she thought, well, this would be fun to go visit my friend. And so she tries to visit her friend and she finds herself in a classroom. It's completely black, except she can see out of body, right? That's a, very common to have good eyesight even when there's no light. So she can see that she's in the complete darkness. She sees that she's in a classroom. There's a chalkboard with some writing on it and stuff. And she finds her friend. She's shivering. She's cold. She's dirty. There's dirt and rubble and everything and she comes back to her body and it's like she's very concerned this is this is terrible well it wasn't for several days that she learned that this is when they had the big tsunami over there and it completely her friend had changed locations but she was on a at a resort or whatever and she was actually in a uh, in a uh, the rubble of a, of a ruined school and there was a, a chalkboard and everything it was all it was all just as Akena had found it there but it was completely destroyed by this tsunami and so this is very um, veridical proof that she was actually there uh, Graham Nichols another out of body teacher in the UK uh, highly recommend his stuff as well um, he had a, a, a few um, OBEs that were uh, objective um, he had a precognitive OBE in 1999 in which he witnessed in his out-of-body experience a, a, a bombing, like a, a subway bombing in London, England. And he's a, he's a Brit himself. 
And uh, it turns out that this actually happened, it came to pass later on, just at that same station he was at and in the same circumstances. Um, also Preston Dennett is another out-of-body uh, author who, um, he, <laughs> he flew to a, a nearby canal, he was in California, I think it was, and he flew to a, a canal and he was looking for proof of his out-of-body experience and he, he went to a, fami a familiar location and he's looking around and there's this canal and everything and he, but he sees, he sees green grass and he's like, I don't remember any green grass here, it's all concrete lined, all of this, this canal is all concrete lined and everything so I, I must be not having out-of-body or whatever and it must not be seen right. He went back to his body, he got in his car, he drove there to that location and there was a big patch of green grass. Um, so again, these are, are real stories from people um, who have done it. Is there evidence that OBEs are not real? Well, yes there are. Um, and in all fairness, um, it's very common for people to induce an out-of-body experience. They see a window open and it's, in reality, it's not open, it's shut. Or a door is open and it's not, it's shut in real life. Um, uh, there were some interesting experiments done. People, uh, adepts, have tried to uh, figure out if this is objective. So Eddie Slasher is a, an author. His book, Explanations Out of the Body, 1997. He did uh, uh, experiments with the Georgia Pick 3 lottery. He thought, I'm going to go out and I'm going to see if I can predict the lottery outcome, the three numbers in the Pick 3. So he would try and project himself into the future. He'd leave his body, project himself into the future, and he'd be like standing in front of his TV the next day. Every day he watched for those numbers on TV to be announced at the time they were being announced. And so he'd stand in front of his TV and he'd watch 397. And he'd write, come back and he'd write that down. He did it over and over and over and over and over. And in one case, he almost got it right. But the numbers, two of the numbers were reversed. Um, but in the most cases, they were, there was a complete failure. He was not able to identify the three numbers. So he gave up. Um, also, Frederick Gardimo has a, a fabulous book, uh, Explorations in Consciousness, from 2012. And he did a series of experiments where he, he was adept at leaving his body. He, he created a, a series of like five or six wooden blocks. And one of them had no nails in it. The next one had one nail in it. The third had two nails in it. And he, he'd have his wife take a, a block from a, a bag at random. He'd fish around, grab a block, and she'd put it in a box. And there, the box would be like locked or whatever next to his bedside. So in the middle of the night, he'd wake up leave his body, and then he'd like put his hand through the box and he'd try to feel for that block. Is it the block with one nail or two nails or three or four or zero? And in almost all cases he got it wrong. And he did get it right a couple times, but if you do the statistical analysis, it's no different than chance. So for every case of amazing um, verification, there are cases where you can say, well, this they tried to do it and they couldn't. Um, so why the discrepancy? Some people believe that what we're seeing out of body is not really reality as it is now, but it's like the, the thought forms or that, the precursor to reality or that we're building reality, a model of reality in the future. So every night you try and build this reality, it's more like a probable universe. So if your door is mostly open, it may appear open even when it's closed in an out of body state, for example. Um, so, from a scientific point of view, can we get better? Can we become better candidates to having OBEs? Um, I talked about this in my new, body, uh, my new book, Hacking the Outer Body Experience, and I believe the answer is yes, um, because of something that neuroscientists call neuroplasticity, the ability for the brain to rewire itself. Um, some things that you can do to become better at out of body is you can play video games because it, it alters your story of experience, right? You're temporarily accepting this avatar of you doing something else. Um, and so playing video games can help that. Um, people who play video games, uh, the, the, it's been proven scientifically that people who have out-of-body experiences, more of them are video game players than, than not. Um, uh, meditation helps. Um, reading good books, again, is using your imagination because every time you read a book, you're trying to imagine in your mind that scenario. She was walking through a dark forest. Okay, you can kind of see that or feel that in your mind, right, um, when you read that. If you're watching it on TV, watching a dark forest, it's not the same thing. That does not stimulate your imagination. 
So watching a story isn't as good as reading a book. Reading a book will stir your imagination and get your active imagination to create those images in your mind, and that's very helpful. Um, there are also things like diet, things you can do with your diet. Um, I believe wheat gluten helps, and the reason is wheat gluten can lower the uh, activity, the, the neural activity in the uh, prefrontal cortex of the brain. And um, scientists have noticed that when you have an OBE, um, the activity in the prefrontal cortex tends to have a sudden drop. So the, the steeper a drop you can create, um, the better. Um, and there are ways you can do that. For example, um, you can build neural activity by doing something like slow physical movements like Tai Chi, right? If you're doing Tai Chi where you're doing very slow physical movements, very precise, that builds neural activity in your physical brain. And then you do something like meditation or yawning, and that will drop your neural activity in the prefrontal cortex, boom, like this. So you want to get that steep curve. Um, and constipation, too. Um, people uh, have noticed in the last few years that eating nuts and cheese and things like that that cause you to become constipated do seem to affect OBEs. So having, more, uh, having less, less of those kind of things might help as well. Um, other helpful conditions, um, it helps to break up sleep. Um, there's a, a very popular technique called wake back to bed, WTBT, or WBTB, wake back to bed, where you set an alarm clock for like six hours after you go to sleep. So you go to sleep, your alarm wakes you up at six hours. At six hours, you stay um, up for a little bit of time, maybe 10, 15 minutes, and then you go back to sleep. And this jarring of your, breaking up of your um, natural uh, circadian rhythm um, or circadian rhythm, which is your sleep rhythm, the natural repeating cycles of sleep. Um, when you break that up, um, it helps to induce OBEs because your body wants to automatically send you back into that. It's like like pushing the stop button on your on your washing machine, right? And and changing its setting a little bit and starting it again. Your but your body wants to continue laundering your brain, but now you've woken up your brain enough to where you can keep that neural connection to consciousness alive. Um, also, practice in the morning and not at not at night. I should say night, not night. Um, practice in the morning and not night because when you're at night, you're too tired to practice. You don't have enough. Um, you got too much melatonin in your in your uh, bloodstream, so you're not going to retain consciousness properly. Um, lying on your back, the vast majority of OBEs happen when you're on your back. So I've had OBEs on my front, on my back, on on either side. Um, but the vast majority have been on my back, and it does seem to help. Um, preferably not in your bed, because we are all preconditioned from years and years of practice and uh, habits to fall asleep as soon as you get to that location and you're in that setting and you're in that comfortable surroundings and you're in your bed. You're conditioned to fall asleep, and you don't want to fall asleep. You want to be in a location that's OBE location. So a lot of people recommend lying on the couch, for example. Um, preferably not next to a spouse. Um, a lot of people have noticed that if you're lying next to your spouse, um, it's harder to induce an OBE. Um, Out-of-body author William Bielman, who's probably the most popular uh, on the subject at the moment, um, he, he has noticed the same thing. He told me that if he's lying next to his wife in bed, he has a heck of a time and he just can't uh, induce an out-of-body. Um, and I've kind of found the same way. It's very difficult if I'm, if I'm lying next to my wife. I have in the past, um, but it's just much more easy without it. Um, also, eating light or even uh, fasting, not eating anything after 3 o'clock seems to help. People uh, are out there, they're doing um, occasional fasts to stimulate their out-of-body ability. Um, and then um, I've got uh, my book, all of this information, and, and probably more than 50 out-of-body techniques are in my book, Hacking the Out-of-Body Experience, which is just uh, released in uh, last year in August. Um, uh, my, my first book I made available for free on the internet on my website, robertpeterson.org. Um, here's my contact information, robertpeterson.org. Um, you can email me, I'm happy to answer questions, but I'm not always good at it. Not, I don't always take the time because I'm busy. Um, my website contains the entire um, text of this first book, Out of Body Experiences, How to Have Them and What to Expect. This is, um, explains in detail how I 
induced out-of-body experiences, the first several, um, but it's not nearly as detailed as the new book. But this goes into a lot of my personal experiences, my OBEs and what's happened to me. Um, the entire text is available on my website for free. Um, I put it out there two years before the book's publication in 1999.